the Spaniard came in sight with his huge sea castles heaving upon the waves. Thousands of soldiers looked down from her decks and laughed, and upshadowing high above us with her yawning tiers of guns, took the breath from our sails, and we stayed. In Alfred Lord Tennyson's epic poem, this huge sea castle with its yawning tiers of guns was the galleon. We usually think of it as the backbone of Spanish treasure fleets, bringing Spain glory and holes bursting with gold and silver. But it was also Spain's nemesis, bringing her mighty armada defeat at the hands of England's so-called sea cavalry. The smaller, faster, race-built galleons developed by men like Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Hawkins. The galleon was also the workhorse of the Age of Discovery, a time that saw European explorers reaching out into the unknown to grasp new sources of wealth and power. These early galleons were often no larger than a modern offshore fishing boat, yet in the hands of master mariners like John Cabot and combined with the newly developed navigational tools of the era, the rugged and highly seaworthy galleon made epic voyages that still stand among the most significant in the entire history of the sea. Ranging between 70 and nearly 200 feet in length, the highly versatile galleon might weigh anywhere from 100 to 1,000 tons or more. Depending on its size, it could be manned by as few as 60 to several hundred sailors and soldiers and its mast sometimes reached over 100 feet high. Blending the best features of many ships from all over the world, the galleon was a triumph of technology. The course it charted opened new worlds, and the changes it brought in its wake are still being felt to this day. To modern eyes, the galleon seems thick, top-heavy, and clumsy. But to the sailors of the 16th century, it was a vast improvement over earlier vessels, combining the best features of several preceding types of ships. The main innovators of this craft were the Spanish, who needed a ship to expand and support their growing overseas empire. The galleon is developed by the Spanish as a transoceanic sailing vessel which has a high capacity to carry essentially the military stores and indeed valuable commodities like specie, gold and silver uh, from the Spanish Empire in, largely in Central America and indeed across the Pacific as well back to Spain uh, to be well armed to defend itself also to have the, the necessary sailing qualities which make it a safe and relatively maneuverable vessel for those purposes. The name galleon itself belies the vessel's origins as an ill-defined hybrid. The term galleon is a, is a rather difficult one, uh, essentially of Spanish origin and meaning different things to different people. It's not like in modern terms being able to give a strict technical differentiation between say a cruiser and a destroyer. Uh, essentially it's a large high quality sailing ship. Because the long, low, oar-driven Mediterranean galley was the most common warship before the advent of the galleon, the name galleon was probably derived from galley as an indication of intended use rather than its association by design. But other types of ships lent more than their name to the development of the galleon. One of its predecessors, the 13th century Mediterranean cog, had a sturdy, rounded hull. Triangular lateen sails had been adopted from Arab ships allowing the vessel to sail more directly into the wind than square-rigged craft. It was piloted by two steering oars on either side of the stern. The northern cog, used for trade in the Baltic and North Seas, was square-rigged and had a fixed rudder, a tremendous advantage over the less reliable and harder to manage steering oars. The Portuguese caravel took the northern cog's rudder and the southern cog's lateen sails and put them on a lighter, more maneuverable hull. The result was ideal for the long-range exploring missions of the 15th century, which required that a ship be able to sail relatively quickly for vast distances, both with and against the wind. But a larger, sturdier vessel would be needed to exploit the new trade routes opened by the caravel. 
The Carrick was the first of the long distance traders. With its large stout hull, it could carry enough cargo to make distant voyages profitable. A unique insight into the design of a Carrick is provided by an extremely rare book of the period, which is currently housed in the Samuel Pepys Library in Cambridge, England. The Carrick was above all a ship for trade. She was built to hold as much as possible, as much gross cargo. She had an enormous hold and she was constructed in such a way that there were as few impediments as possible in the hold. She had, of course, to be defensible. Nobody was safe in a world that was full of warring nations and of pirates. She was certainly not a ship of offense. That's to say, her aim was not to attack other ships. It was defensive. Hence, you get the huge uh, forecastles and aftercastles. One customary tactic that was used at the time, let your enemy board you and then fight them from the forecastles and the aftercastles as they came onto the deck. Its soaring fore and aft castles gave a Carrick the appearance of a formidable floating fortress. But these same features also made the ship clumsy and unmanageable. An early 16th century Portuguese pilot named Gaspar Ferreira Ramon had this to say after he steered a carrack. Damn the fool who piled such top-heavy works on so small a keel that when there is little wind she loses way. It makes my blood curdle to be on such a ship. May God forgive the man who built it. Clearly an improved vessel was needed. One that melded the size and strength of the carrack with the more responsive sailing characteristics of the caravel. The mingling of ideas and commerce of north, south, and east initiated with the Crusades in the 12th century led to the combination of the best elements from Mediterranean and European vessels into a single ship. The result was the galleon. The galleon was sturdy like the cog and carrack, but showed the longer, more graceful lines of the galley and caravel. Square sails from the north, as well as lateen sails from the east, for closer work into the wind, were spread on three or four masts, a southern trait. And the fixed rear rudder provided a sure sense of control. But internally and externally, there were several notable differences between the galleon and its predecessors. The essential differences between a, a ship like this, which is a Spanish galleon of around 1590, or a modern, modern model one, um, uh, and a carrack, is that you've got a rather longer length to beam ratio. This is a finer ship in hull terms. The height of the castles fore and aft, the forecastle here and the aftercastle here, has been reduced, and it's also much more integrated into the rest of the dead work, that is the above water structure of the ship. This is the general trend of all these ships, to move from what looks like a hull with things tacked on the top to a fully integrated structure. With the intense competition for trade at that time, the details of ship design became closely guarded state secrets. Nevertheless, the features of the Spanish galleon were soon copied and modified by other nations. What exactly the design of these things was is, of course, uh, you know, still a continuing and, and somewhat fascinating mystery because at this period there are practically no plans at all. There is only really one document which covers this. Compiled by a famous 16th century English shipwright named Matthew Baker, that document was called The Fragments of Ancient Shipwritery. It is the first manuscript to show in detail the scantlings and internal construction of a galleon. And that is what we've got in this drawing here. And the fascinating thing, as opposed to a carrack, a galleon internally was constructed with a whole series of braces and of knees and of separate decks. Now these made it very awkward as a cargo carrier, though of course galleons did carry cargoes, but it made it ideal as a gun platform. Soon rows of cannon were mounted in the galleon's rigidly braced hull, providing a powerful defensive and offensive capability for the ship. By the middle of the 16th century, the general lines of this new craft had been established. For the first time in Western maritime history, 
A single vessel combined all the features necessary to make it useful in trade, exploration, and war. But in order to make the long voyages that would be required, even the galleon would be useless without the instruments to chart its way across the trackless seas. Many of these would be developed and refined under the patronage of a ruler who stood at the very forefront of this most international age. A man dubbed the Navigator, despite the fact that he never once embarked on the voyages of exploration he organized. The galleon rose to prominence during the European Renaissance of the 14th through 16th centuries. It was a time of unprecedented advances in art, literature, and science, and the galleon was a direct result of the new spirit of experimentation and melding of ideas. One of the most important and least appreciated figures in this movement was Prince Henry of Portugal, better known as Henry the Navigator. During his reign in the early 15th century, Henry assembled an international group of geographers, astronomers, chart makers, pilots, master mariners, mathematicians, and students at his academy. In an effort to expand Portuguese trade and spread Christianity, Henry's scholars developed better charts and planned missions of exploration. But perhaps most importantly for the future of the galleon, they improved on the rudimentary navigational instruments then in use. One modern mariner with first-hand experience using these early instruments is Sir Robin Knox Johnston, the first person to sail solo non-stop around the world. Right, well, the basic thing you needed to do was measure the height of the sun, or the star, polar star, and so they just wanted something that would measure an angle vertically. They started off with a thing that looks like a protractor and just had a weight on a bit of string, and they just tilt this, line it up, and measure the angle off. They then got a little bit more sophisticated, and they introduced the astrolabe. Now, the astrolabe actually was invented by the Greeks before the birth of Christ, but it didn't really come into navigational use until the 15th century. When I crossed the Atlantic using just an astrolabe, I was no more than eight miles out when I arrived on the American side, and I'd had nothing else to check with for 35 days. Well, that really rather proves the instruments, if used carefully, could be quite accurate. During the mid-1400s, Prince Henry scholars took basic tools like the astrolabe and refined them. But it required more than improved instruments to achieve accurate navigation. The problem was, of course, they needed tables. You couldn't just take a, an altitude of the sun without knowing where the sun was. And that only came in in 1485, when the Portuguese developed tables for the sun. What led them to do that is they're the first Europeans to cross the equator, and they lost the pole star. So they had to work out something else. So they put together some mathematicians and cosmographers and ship's captains. And a year later, they had tables. And I've used them. And today, they'll give you a reading to within a mile, which, when you think about it, was quite remarkable. Tables like these became standard tools for mariners of the period. Over 100 years later, Sir Francis Drake himself would use a pocket-sized book of tables during his campaign against the Spanish Armada. This extraordinary book was in fact owned by Francis Drake. And here is his signature. Like Shakespeare, he couldn't spell his name. He wrote it D-R-A-K. What it is, is a tidal almanac for the English Channel uh, based on the mouth of the Seine. And so it relates to the phases of the moon, and if you know the phase of the moon and you have this, you can calculate the tides for all of the channel. And attached to it, put in by Drake, we presume, is a map showing the approaches to the channel. And of course, it's the route which was followed by the Spanish Armada in its attempt on England in 1588. Using the improved instruments and tables, the galleon made voyages that helped mold the era into an age of discovery, unlike anything else in European history. Yet despite the advances made by Prince Henry and his successors, serious navigational problems still remained. The main problem of navigation in the age of the galleons is that nobody knew what the problems were. To take a very obvious example, deviation of the compass. Compasses were thought to be the latest gift of technology. But actually, of course, they were wildly wrong. So it was a long time before the difference between the magnetic North Pole and the true geographic North Pole was realized. And this applied for other things as well. They couldn't, for instance, calculate how far east and west they'd gone. 
because they know time. They know accurate timepieces. So if they wanted to go between one continent and another, quite often they'd sail down the side of one until they got to the right latitude, and then sail across, bearing in mind they could keep to that latitude pretty accurately with the very rudimentary instruments they had. And when they reached the other side, they should be pretty close to their destination, with luck within sight from the masthead. And the most extraordinary things happen as a result. One of the extraordinary things that happens is that, of course, Brazil was discovered apparently as a result of an accident. The fleet that found it was aiming for the Spanish main. Notwithstanding mistakes like these, famous mariners of the age like John Cabot and Samuel de Champlain continued reaching out for new horizons. And their most versatile and reliable vessel was the galleon. It aided them in making discoveries that helped shape the world as we know it today. Yet no matter how advanced its design was compared to earlier ships, the galleon was still comparatively frail when measured against the vast distances it sailed and the awesome power of the sea. I think what would uh, surprise people today is just how small they were. Most of the galleons being used in those early voyages of exploration were no more than a couple of hundred tons. In fact, some of them were a good deal less, about the size of a, an offshore fishing boat. And into that you'd fit 60, 80 men perhaps, depending on the purpose. They'd have to live in there, cook, eat, sleep, carry all their stores, supplies, everything. No hammocks except on the deck. And really the life was pretty rough. If you think with Vasco da Gama's voyage, three quarters of the crew died during the course of their voyage to India and back, and yet they thought it was worth it. But then life was no better ashore, so I suppose they thought it was a way of getting away from the wife. As Spain's overseas empire expanded, so did the numbers of galleons she possessed. Once a year, from Nombre de Dios in Panama, fleets of Spanish treasure ships, their holds laden with precious metals and other goods, departed for the return trip to Spain. The galleons in these fleets were larger and more elaborate than their earlier sisters. But for the sailors on board, life was not much better than it had been on the voyages of exploration. Cooking was always a problem because the great menace was far. They actually laid a half of bricks and very often cooking was done in the open on deck. A diet was necessarily simple. We actually have the Spanish Armado cargo book and it's a monotonous list of beans, rice, vinegar, oil, and wine. That obviously was something which did chill them up a bit. For protection, massive war galleons accompanied the fleets of caravels, carracks, and cargo galleons as an escort. Like the armed carrack from which it evolved, the basic idea behind the Spanish-style war galleon was that of the castle. The surrounding sea was seen as a moat to be crossed by soldiers who would board the enemy craft and fight it out on the mid-deck. If boarded, the ship could be defended from the castles fore and aft. Faced with the challenge of attacking these giants, the English would eventually come up with an ingenious solution. Instead of building bigger ships than the Spanish, they would go in the opposite direction, building smaller, faster galleons. The difference between a Spanish galleon, which is a very lofty, large ship, and an English galleon, is that the one is the, the means of transport of the military Spanish Empire, and its fighting vessel, whereas the English galleon is a much smaller vessel, uh, which is essentially designed to raid and attack the Spanish enemy. While the Spanish war galleon was the carrier of a seaborne army, the English galleon would become like naval cavalry. And among England's most daring sea horsemen was a man who would go down in history as one of the great mariners of his age. A leader who would play a pivotal role in the epic clash between the English Navy and Spain's Grand Armada. And who would be among the main innovators of the English race-built galleon, Sir Francis Drake. In 1568, 28-year-old Francis Drake, a native of Devon, England, was in San Juan de Lua, the port for Veracruz, Mexico. He'd come on a trading mission as captain of the Judith, one of six ships in the fleet of his cousin, John Hawkins, a man already notorious as a pirate, slaver, and flaunter of Spanish law. The voyage to Mexico was Drake's first transatlantic crossing. Two of the six ships in Hawkins' fleet belonged to Queen Elizabeth I of England, and their presence in Mexico was a blatant affront to Spanish authority. 
When the newly appointed Spanish Viceroy of Mexico arrived in Veracruz, accompanied by war galleons and armed merchantmen, he was eager to exert his new authority. The Viceroy had scarcely agreed to let Hawkins' ships leave the harbor when he gave the order to attack. The heavy cannons on the Spanish galleons erupted with devastating effect. The broadside of a galleon could have caused all kinds of damage. I wouldn't have wanted to be within the reach of the guns of a carrot, let alone the broadside of a galleon. At the beginning of the galleon period, people are using, above all, stone cannonballs. One of the things that happened at San Juan de Lua was that the Spaniards were using metal balls which fragmented. We don't know whether this was by design or accident. But the devastation on the English ships was quite extraordinary because fragmenting balls meant fragmenting wood and wood which, which had splintered and the incidence of death from gangrene in particular caused above all by splinter wounds was horrible. The results of this deceitful attack on the English ships were extremely serious. Drake in fact got away in the Judith but the principal queen ship there, which was the Jesus of Lubeck, an old carrack, was sunk. Uh, and in fact, the, the Spaniards, of course, justified this, you know, since they had interlopers in the empire. Uh, but of course, the English considered this to be an act of treachery, which in a sense it was. And after that, Drake's hatred of the Spaniards became a personal thing as much as one of uh, policy. His cousin, um, Robert Barrett, was actually captured and subsequently burnt by the Inquisition in Seville because he refused to turn Roman Catholic and this seems to have preyed on Drake's mind. Francis Drake was a changed man. Declaring his own private war on Spain, he was determined to find a better way to combat the large Spanish galleons that had defeated the English at San Juan de Lua. The result would transform the English galleon into a swift predator, the race-built galleon. The race-built galleon uh, really seems to have evolved from the mind of Francis Drake after his bitter experiences uh, at saint Juan de Lua. Uh, and he returned from that uh, a saddened and a much wiser man. He learnt several lessons. One was about fire ships, which the Spaniards had attempted to use against the English. And the other lesson he learnt was about manoeuvrability. The minion, the smaller vessel, which was manoeuvrable, escaped the Jesus of Lubeck, which was a heavy, hard-to-handle carrick, bulky, beamy, did not. English shipwrights like Matthew Baker began applying these lessons to the construction of a new generation of English galleons, gradually adopting a more sophisticated method of ship design in the process. This is perhaps more revolutionary than you might imagine. It's the first known picture of naval architects at work. It would be lovely to think that this is really Matthew Baker, a self-portrait. But the thing about it that is so exciting is that they are actually working from lines. They're not building a model which could then be dismantled and everything enlarged onto the lofting room floor, which was the customary means of building. And it demonstrates the way in which English builders, in particular, were thinking and were adopting new methods, new instruments, new drawing instruments, uh, new mathematical techniques, and applying these to the design of ships. Combined with Francis Drake's and others' ideas, the more scientific methods of English ship design created a lower, leaner galleon, one whose main punch came from its cannons, which, though smaller, had a longer range than Spanish guns, but English shipwrights drew their inspiration from more than science and the mind of Francis Drake. This is a famous image. Uh, first of all, in terms of galleons, this is a, this is a race-built galleon, if you look at, at, the, at the line of the, of the deck, but she still has a forecastle and aftercastle, though these are perhaps in some ways as much decorative as defensive. The real kill in the armament is in the line of the broadside. And then beyond that, it's the first known attempt to apply the concept of hydrodynamics to ship design. And you can see the wonderful way in which 
a mackerel has been taken and the shipwright, the ship designer, the naval architect has been thinking of the flow of water around a ship's body and has obviously aimed to replicate it. The mackerel was a predator, so too were English race-built galleons. Uh, you can also see on this drawing one other feature of the English galleon which made it less vulnerable and also actually made it swifter as well and that is the streamlined rudder with hardly anything showing above the surface, hardly anything vulnerable to being shot away. In 1576 Francis Drake built a small sturdy new race-built galleon at slightly more than 100 tons and only 70 feet long, the ship that would eventually be named the Golden Hind was intended to make only one voyage from Plymouth, England to Plymouth, England. Drake planned to be the first Englishman to circle the globe. But unlike some earlier explorers, Drake's goal wasn't to find a new trade route to the riches of the Orient. It was to gain riches by a different means, by taking them from the hated Spanish. And one of Drake's most important backers was his queen, Elizabeth I, who was hungry for riches herself. Essentially what you have is you have the other countries of Europe who at this time were not rich, England was not a rich country, watching, in Drake's period, this vast Spanish empire growing. Spain itself was quite a wealthy country in European terms, but the loot it was taking out of Central America was, 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 was astronomical the English knew that the Spaniards were expanding along the Pacific coast and Drake's intention was in a sense to get out of the main sea lanes of the Atlantic where things had been pretty hot and to go round into the less uh, threatening areas of the Pacific find out the degree to which the Spaniards were expanding and to raid their commerce. The two-year voyage was a fantastic success. When Drake returned to England he was a rich man knighted by a grateful and now more wealthy queen. Sir Francis Drake was a national hero to the English. To the Spanish, he was a public enemy, a pirate they dubbed the devil with the red beard. Drake's voyage established England as a sea power to be reckoned with and a threat to King Philip of Spain's far-flung empire. To counter England's rise, Philip began to expand his navy, adding ever larger and more imposing galleons. Finally, in 1587, with relations with England strained to the breaking point, Philip began to assemble a huge fleet of galleons and other warships. His goal was to destroy England once and for all. And the backbone of this mighty armada would be his Spanish-style galleons. As intelligence filtered back to England about the Spanish and their invincible armada, the English began preparations of their own. Queen Elizabeth appointed Sir Francis Drake's cousin, John Hawkins, the former pirate and sea dog, to head the Navy board. Drawing on personal experience and the strategic thinking of men like Drake, Hawkins supervised the construction and reconstruction of ships to fit the new specifications of the English galleon. He had a, a responsibility to improve uh, the, the Queen's ships obviously both to attack and to defend uh, the British shores against the Spanish Empire. And uh, Hawkins is credited, if not with the specific design of these ships, but at least encouraging the refinement of the so-called English race-built galleon. Meanwhile, in Lisbon and Cadiz, Philip's armada continued to expand. But the English weren't about to sit idly by while their enemy grew stronger. In April of 1587, Sir Francis Drake led a fleet of 26 fast ships and galleons to Cadiz for a preemptive strike. And of course this is all familiar ground, um, familiar water perhaps I should say, as far as Drake was concerned, because here we go from Plymouth uh, and across the Bay of Biscay down to Cadiz, or as he would have said, Cadiz. Drake came in blasting. When he withdrew, he left behind some 30 wrecked Spanish ships and sufficient damage to delay the campaign for 15 months. Drake, in his words, had singed King Philip's beard. 
But Philip wasn't about to abandon his holy enterprise because of the actions of an upstart English freebooter. He was now more determined than ever to punish the English and their insolent queen. In May of 1588, with preparations finally complete, King Philip's mighty armada of 73 galleons and 57 other ships set sail under the command of Don Alonso, the Duke of Medina Sidonia. Across the channel, Drake, Hawkins, and the English galleons were waiting. And when the Spanish armada was sighted off the coast, the English fleet of 35 race-built galleons and 67 other warships immediately put to sea. But the Spanish had no interest in engaging in a naval battle. Their purpose was to support an all-out land attack of England by a Spanish army under the command of the Duke of Parma. The thing to remember about the Armada is that it is an invasion fleet. This is not a fight between two big naval forces which are going to smash each other to bits. Essentially, it's a tight defensive formation with a particular aim in view. It comes up the channel from Spain, maintaining its formation against harassment. It goes to the coast of Holland. It embarks the Duke of Parma's army. This was the idea. And then again, in a tight formation, it's supposed to cross the channel, land the army in England, land the siege train, batter down the walls of London. That's the scheme. The two sides also differed in tactics. The English galleon was a pure gun platform. Its method of engagement was the artillery duel at a suitably accurate range of up to a few hundred yards, but no closer. Grappling, boarding, and close combat with the Spanish force was to be avoided at all costs. The Spanish still saw their galleons as floating castles. The surrounding sea, a moat. The field of battle, the deck the prime function of her cannons to disable the enemy's rigging as a preliminary to boarding. While the armada made its way up the channel, the two fleets eyed each other warily. Finally, on July 21st, 1588, the battle began when the English commander, Lord Howard of Epping, had fired on a large Spanish galleon. Meanwhile, Drake led his squadron toward the armada's rear guard wing cutting loose the huge galleon San Juan and pounding her while keeping far enough away to prevent being boarded. But despite some successes, the English couldn't break the solid phalanx of the Spanish ships. Now, the Armada, in fact, got up the channel with great success. They had this famous crescent half-moon defensive formation which proved extremely effective against the continuous harassment of the English fleet. It maintained its formation. Bits got chipped off as it went up the channel, but essentially it remained intact until it came off the banks of Holland and it anchored, in fact, off Graveline, like a big threatening black cloud, barely 30 miles or so from the coast of England. And at this point, Drake had a good idea, in fact, a very brilliant idea. Once again, drawing on his experiences at San Juan de Lua, Drake's plan was to wait until nightfall then sent a group of blazing fire ships drifting into the anchored armada. His goal was to panic the Spanish into cutting their anchor cables, scattering them piecemeal into the stormy North Sea. And in fact, this is what happened. They sent down a, a, a group of fire ships, which is what you see here in the middle. The Spanish, who were anchored in a fairly tight formation, cut their cables and lost the anchors. The wind took them into the North Sea in confusion. The English then attacked. There was a battle, which is known as the Battle of Graveline, between the two. I mean, basically, it was putting the dogs among the sheep at this stage. And the Spanish were reduced to total confusion and went north into the North Sea. With the English fleet in hot pursuit, the Spanish commander made a fateful decision. He continued to sail north. Drake later said that he had never been more pleased by anything in his life than seeing the enemy set a northward course. That was the end of the affair, essentially, because as Drake knew, and as any seaman knew, with the wind blowing from the west, once a, a ships of this type, whose sailing capacities do not amount to being able to, to beat into the teeth of a gale, least of all in any sort of useful military formation, once they had been got past the critical point i.e. the east coast of Kent, there was no way back. They simply couldn't return. Uh, 
the wind wouldn't allow them to do it. They had to go north about, round Scotland, to get back to Spain. And the results were catastrophic. The English chased them north and just chased them on their heels and then called off the chase short of ammunition and left them to the will of God and the weather. Battered by storms, the larger but less seaworthy Spanish ships and galleons were decimated. In the end, only 67 out of 130 ships in the Invincible Armada ever returned to Spain. King Philip withdrew to the privacy of his palace to ponder why God had turned his back on his crusade against the thieving English. In England, Queen Elizabeth composed a song of thanksgiving in which she wrote, He made the winds and waters to rise and scatter all mine enemies. By outsailing and outgunning the Armada's lumbering galleons, the rugged and seaworthy English race-built galleon had proven itself to be the best warship in the world. In 1589, less than a year after the defeat of his mighty armada, King Philip began rebuilding his fleet. But he had learned an important lesson from the English and their race-built galleons. No longer would he depend entirely on huge Spanish-style galleons as the backbone of his naval power. Instead, as a tentative first step in a new direction, he hired an Italian shipwright named Julian Diasati to build him 12 galleons in the English style. This group became known as the Twelve Apostles. While Philip rebuilt, Queen Elizabeth sent Drake on a raid against the Spanish in the Caribbean. This time it was Drake who commanded an armada. 126 ships and galleons and nearly 21,000 men. But Sir Francis Drake wasn't the only Englishman who knew how to fight the Spanish. In 1591, an English fleet tried to blockade the Azores. When a much larger Spanish fleet arrived, Drake's old flagship from the Armada campaign, the Galleon Revenge, which was now under the command of Sir Richard Grenville, stayed to fight alone as the rest of the English fleet withdrew. In fact, what happened was he was a man of very choleric and aggressive temper, and he thought that his course of honor was to fight with the Spaniards. And in fact, he, he he made a mistake, he, he shouldn't have done it. There was actually no need to do it, I forget the exact detail, but, but he sought uh, an action uh, with the Spaniards and, and threw a much smaller ship against much larger ones and, and put up a very gallant fight, uh, but, but was overwhelmed eventually by weight of numbers. Outnumbered 53 to one, the revenge didn't stand a chance. For 15 hours, she held off the Spanish warships as one after another attempted boarding. Finally, with her upper works and rigging shot away, and nearly every Englishman aboard dead or wounded, including Grenville, the Revenge was captured. Grenville was taken on board the Spanish flagship where he in fact died of his wounds. Uh, and the Revenge was but a, a pyrrhic victory for the Spaniards. She was so badly, badly shot up that she actually sank uh, under, the, under the island crags. The little revenge went down neath the island crags and was lost evermore to the main, as Tennyson put it in his Victorian poem on the subject. It is significant that in the 25 years of naval combat between England and Spain, the revenge was the only English galleon ever sunk by gunfire. By 1592, the English discovered that Spain was building some 40 new galleons in the English style. Even more troubling, these galleons were being constructed under the supervision of English shipbuilders in King Philip's hire. In 1596, Philip launched a second invasion of England, using his new galleons as the core of his fleet. But the Spanish didn't understand how to use the new ships effectively. They still saw them as platforms for their soldiers rather than as platforms for their cannon. Partly as a result, Philip's second armada suffered losses that were nearly as great as the first. A third armada was driven back to Spain by storms in 1597. The fourth and final Spanish armada landed some 5,000 troops on the South Irish coast in 1601. But three months later, 
Cut off and isolated by the English fleet, they were forced to surrender. Finally, the Treaty of Westminster in 1604 brought the Spanish-English War to an inconclusive end. The Spanish War essentially ran out of steam. Philip II, who had been its main prosecutor, uh, died in 1598, and Elizabeth herself died in 1603. The, the protagonists had gone, the war just wound down from that cause, so the thing just basically came to a natural conclusion after a long period, and it just ended. The weather, the resolve of bold leaders like Queen Elizabeth, Sir Francis Drake, and Sir John Hawkins, and the remarkable English galleon had held the world's most powerful nation at bay. England was now on its way to becoming the greatest naval force the world had ever known. It was a foundation that was built squarely upon the sturdy timbers of her race-built galleons. But even the amazingly versatile galleon eventually had to give way to the march of progress. By the 1670s, the English war galleon was being supplanted by two new type of warships. I think the galleon in England was replaced because the English had discovered how to beat the galleon. Uh, and the race-built galleon eventually evolved into something else. Um, either it evolved into the immense ship of the line with three rows of broadsides, or the frigate with its just single row. Uh, but there is, in fact, a, a curious continuity. Um, ship design gathers, it does evolve as countries compete with each other and as the existence of line drawings means that technical advances can be communicated other than by actually capturing an enemy vessel and then having it copied in your own dockyards. Though this was quite common even into the 18th century. But there is a kind of continuity in the post-Gallion era because galleons did carry cargo, were used as merchant ships outside times of war. Well, after it ceased to be the world's dominant warship, the Portuguese continued to build galleons for use in their trade with India. These ships were built from teak wood, which enabled them to last nearly twice as long as those built from the finest European oak. In 1680, galleons were still sailing regularly between Lisbon and India, and the term galleon was in use as late as the early 19th century to describe the great Spanish cargo ships sailing between Manila and the Philippines and Acapulco, Mexico. The last of these so-called Manila galleons arrived in Acapulco in 1815, over 200 years after the defeat of the Spanish Armada. The reign of the galleon as mistress of the sea saw an explosion in maritime activity that was unmatched to that time. In exploration, in commerce, and in war, these remarkable vessels led the world. Yet even following their inevitable demise, the galleon still lived on. Rather touchingly, when a new ship was built bearing an old name, for instance the London, then one timber of her predecessor was taken out and built into her. In this symbolic way, the race-built galleons that had helped defeat the Spanish Armada continued to roam the oceans of the world in a new generation of ships, one that evolved directly from the daring sea cavalry of Sir Francis Drake. Now, from the History Channel, you can own the episode you've just seen from the...